Hello everyone. Welcome to a new episode of our International Tax Webinar Series. Um, today we'll be talking about transfer pricing strategies in times of great uncertainty due to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Leslie Hornoon and I will be moderating the conversation today. Um, I am joined by our global transfer pricing team and I will um, introduce everyone for you now. Um, first, we have Carlos Camacho, our global transfer pricing leader. Hi, Carlos. Hi, good morning to everyone. Thank you. Um, we have Christian Jandorf representing HLB Germany. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Christian. Um, we have Federico Mariscalco from HLB Italy. Hello, everyone. Hi, Federico. And finally, uh, Marina Gentile from HLB USA. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so uh, we will be taking questions on the webinar today. Everyone that is listening, please use the chat box to post any questions that you may have for our presenters. And towards the end of the webinar, we will uh, reserve some time to answer your questions. So let's get started. Um, value chain reorganization. Um, in uh, so transfer pricing models may need to be adjusted to come in line uh, with any commercially driven changes made to the global supply chain and to uh, ensure these strategies reflect any reallocation of things like people, functions, assets and uh, risk across multinational enterprises. Um, Carlos, if I may start with you, would you like to uh, elaborate on uh, value chain reorganization? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I guess one of the things we have to all acknowledge is that one of the biggest challenges uh, coming out of this pandemic is basically the uh, need to reinvent a uh, way of uh, keeping up uh, as competitive as possible uh, within the business environment. This will have to be led tax-wise by the analysis of the value chain and the organization and restructuring of this uh, value chain that is one of the main columns of the TP models today after uh, the issuance of BEPS, which in fact, uh, one of the main question marks is whether or not BEPS is going to accelerate, BEPS is going to be uh, just uh, slow down as a result of the need of the world to uh, get used to the, the new reality. And of course, the alignment of the supply chain is going to have a twofold approach. One is the natural economical uh, realignment of the supply chain. There are several suppliers that are not going to be in business once uh, we go back to our regular, so-called regular activities. And then we'll have to resource and refine the value chain uh, supply and the reflection on the relocation of the people and their other functions is going to be also another major challenge of keeping up businesses after this uh, economical shock. The economical shock coming out as a result of this uh, health emergency is uh, yet uh, a developing uh, phenomena, therefore is hard to say at this stage, how is it that this reallocation of the value chain is going to end up being, but of course, businesses should be focused today in uh, bearing in mind that while doing the uh, alignment of the value chain, these assets, functions, and risks that are inherent to the organization of any business uh, in the today's economy is going to be uh, one of the main uh, drivers of the new tax impact uh, regarding the uh, value chain analysis. Uh, this is going to uh, really create a, a major hit 
regarding the digital economy as well, which is one of the pending uh, documents still from the OECD regarding the uh, action number one of digital economy, which is uh, one of the major activities that is being propelled by the need of having no physical contact and the confination of uh, individuals to home or work from home uh, due to the uh, uh, health uh, emergencies. So I guess that the risk across the multinational enterprises uh, of any size is going to be increased. And of course, depending on the uh, activity, depending on the business and the industry, this will have different impacts and value chain will uh, have to be reassessed. It's not going to be the same as it used to be. And that uh, has to have both economical uh, reasoning behind as well as a, a good economical support to make value for tax authorities when these uh, difficult times are going to become subject to audit. Yeah, Carlos, um, Marina Gentile here. I think that's an, an excellent point. And, you know, the, the main theme is everyone is really um, going to reorganize in one way or another, you know, depending on the degree. But I think in times like this, this sort of global disruption, it brings to light, you know, sort of maybe weaknesses in the organization that, um, or, or things that can be improved in, in every organization. So as, you know, companies start to kind of realign with the changes of the times, um, you know, the, the transfer pricing needs to reflect that as well. It, it can't just be same as last year, same as it's always been, you know, we need to sort of reassess, you know, the, the value drivers, you know, what are the different functions, risks, you know, assets in, in the, across the entities. Yeah, that, that leads us to, to the point of whether or not the OECD should be working on a chapter 10 of the guidelines regarding the uh, how to treat these absolutely extraordinary situations that are not reorganizations of will, but reorganizations of need. Right. You know, I think we, I think we're going to see tax authorities quiet on the subject. Uh, OECD might might step up and 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 get some guidance out there, but um, I think, you know, I think historically, the trend seems to be okay, business as usual until the taxpayer steps up and, you know, argues of some kind of adjustment or not normal case of operation or you know, um, some kind of uh, difference that should be accounted for. But we'll see which brings more uncertainty to the equation. And of course, as uh, transfer pricing leaders, our role and the role of any other uh, individuals that are involved in transfer pricing practice is to uh, uh, take the lead and uh, get uh, solutions that uh, have a wise business approach in order to be subject to be challenged by tax authorities that are going to be really uh, eager to uh, collect more taxes as a result of these uh, new needs. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, we we have talked about the relocation of function in order to better manage the economic crisis due to COVID-19. And I would like to outline that in such cases, uh, multinational enterprises uh, should to evaluate which are the impacts in terms of function relocation and if the relocations could be considered permanent or not. In case of permanent relocations of functions, risk of PE, permanent establishment, or business restructurings should be investigated. And another point, in, uh, in case of business restructuring, evaluation models that we usually use to evaluate the, the effects of the business restructuring 
have to be considered COVID-19 impacts. And uh, this is, uh, for instance, the case of the use of discounted cash flows. Yes, the big, the big challenge is how to impute an interest that is going to be fair market for the discount amount of the cash flows and how is it you are going to risk yourself to say that those projections that you're basing your valuation on are uh, fairly uh, reasonable. Yeah. Thank you. So do um, we move on? Yes. Um, so if we want to um, now discuss tax audit, um, I think, um, yeah, we expect to see a focus on uh, transfer pricing after the COVID-19 crisis period to verify reasons for losses. Um, Marina, from a tax audit point of view, can you explain why that is? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think just incentive wise, you know, there's a little bit of a holding pattern, certainly in the US here with the IRS. And I know other tax authorities around the world where, you know, um, audits are a little bit on pause and, and you know, trying to get through a, a you know, a world pandemic, right, and, and having other priorities. Um, I believe, you know, once uh, things get up and running again, you know, there's going to be a tremendous incentive to try to make up lost revenue you know around um around these delays and pauses so i am gonna i'm gonna predict definitely an increase in um tax audits in general and certainly in relation to transfer pricing i mean let's face it in a lot of ways it's it's low-hanging fruit right it's the the um something that you know put putting effort towards um can really you know bring in uh some revenue to the tax authorities um and also you know, rightly so, they're gonna, we're going to see differences. You know, their economic circumstances have completely changed. A lot of uncertainty out there. You know, p you know, taxpayers that are taking the same old, same old position are going to fall out of their respective um, metrics, right? So if they're benchmarking against comparables, you know, they're not going to be in line as they have been in prior years. So it's something that... Um, you know, I think is really going to be on on everybody's radar, you know, as it should be. Um, you know, the IRS certainly, and I predict probably other tax authorities, they're a little bit quiet on the subject in terms of transfer pricing documentation and whether, you know, I think this the silence sort of takes the position of this is a normal course of business. So it's up to the taxpayer to, you know, tell the story of their business that you know, isn't transfer pricing or tax manipulation, right? So this is the economic, this is the operational situation about my business, and I'm going to quantify and adjust accordingly. So whether we take the, you know, profitability of the, the tested party of the taxpayer and quantify, you know, you know, but for COVID-19 disruptions, our sales would have been X, and now they're significantly lower, or our expenses are significantly higher, or we have one-off type of expenses, uh, like, uh, you know, severance costs because of, you know, layoffs or, or whatever is happening. Um, you know, and, and every business is unique. So, uh, you know, I believe that the businesses need to now really uh, kind of track this, quantify and adjust. That's, that's the theme here. Yes, Marina. And in fact, one of the major challenges of uh, the uniqueness of the businesses is the fact of keeping as much as possible documented every other business reason why these uh, decisions that wouldn't be taken under regular circumstances uh, are urged to be taken because that very silence that you refer to from tax authorities all over the world uh, is only normal. Is that they're right. focused on trying to get the economy just uh, up and running as much as possible. But in the other side, this is only uh, imputing more and more uh, burden of proof to 
the taxpayers to be able to support a tax audit three, four years from now when tax auditors are going to have a little memory of what was the reality uh, nowadays. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in, in particular with advanced pricing agreements, I wanna make sure I, I hit up on that. Um, it, actually, the, the APA office in the US did come out uh, pretty quickly with uh, some some commentary on the fact that you know you know not every APA is now sort you know uh, uncertain you know and and sort of proposing that the onus be on the taxpayer to um, propose some kind of adjustment if an adjustment is needed or you know special circumstance and and actually saying why don't you look back to you know 2008 or other years where there was a bit of an economic downturn and how were things handled during that time so i thought that was actually very interesting now the apa program in the us is a it's a voluntary program it's you know very different than the irs audit uh, function so it's just specific to you know taxpayers that have volunteered to be in that program and and um, you know get that that tax certainty and that transfer pricing certainty but yes uh, also in italy uh, apa program is uh, voluntary but could be a useful instrument uh, if uh, a multinational enterprise is going to define a certain tp policies in fiscal year 2020 and uh, another point regarding apa uh, regarding the APA already in place, because uh, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, these uh, uh, APAs uh, might be re re renegotiated if uh, previous conditions are not in line with the current economic situations. Well, maybe one point from my side. If we talk about tax audit, we could put this topic into a broader context. If we go one step back and look on the situation of the states worldwide, if we look on the necessities of the companies, but also of the states, then uh, what do we see? I think we cannot talk about transfer pricing after COVID-19 without thinking about the future fiscal and budgetary policies of the states and the necessities of the state revenue will massively influence also the view on transfer pricing and maybe it's uh, there's a coin with two sides the first side of the coin is that a state tax policy tax policy has to create incentives for the economy to grow meaning not necessarily meaning lower tax rates because they do not help if you make losses but maybe uh, better circumstances for intertemporary loss compensation and so on or uh, better rules for um, uh, uh, um, investment depreciations and so on this is let's say one side of the coin where the state shows itself generous to the taxpayer with a certain uh, goal to the objective to make economy run again. The second side of the same coin is that all this add these uh, 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 subsidies state at must be finance. And the crisis so far has serious consequences for the public budgets and all are negative. Revenues are falling, expenditures are rising, short-term work unemployment, and so on. And um, uh, what will this lead to in tax terms? One point is that we are very likely to see that the state will reach into the pockets of the citizens let's say solidarity taxes for our earners that's maybe the private side of tax and if we come to corporate taxation the state the state have to find out where can we gather money where can we collect the money 
and there we are at the point. The international group relationships are one decisive spot, uh, is one decisive spot where the state can collect money, uh, where the state can increase the, the pace, the, the, the piece of the tax cake without doing harm to the own budget, but with doing harm to the budget of the other states. And then what I expect is um, that the countries, the states, will play in future a very aggressive role in order to uh, gather their piece of the tax cake. And in terms of transfer price, we can foresee that we have um, uh, big negotiations in order to settle uh, the, um, uh, the tax cases and in order to negotiate with one authority and the other. So the times will be very challenging and the thing is that we still don't know uh, what will the actual result uh, will be. So it's uh, not only a time of economic <laughs> uncertainty but also of um, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty for us, uh, how we have to deal with uh, this uh, topic in the future. And, and Christian, uh, you know, good point, it's live now, right? So no one knows the end yet. And I, I definitely noticed with my clients, you know, they're being impacted in phases and it just depends on their unique business and their industries, right? So as I check in to, to try to see what the pain points are for my clients and how they're impacted, I'm getting surprises, you know, like my giant whose whole supply chain is in China, um, you know, and, and sells through commercial retail space where people really aren't going into those stores uh, as much as they used to. Um, they're not as impacted because they were able to predict to some extent, it it coincided with Chinese New Year. They they you know overstocked their supplies, et cetera. So they're not as impacted as as I expected. And then other companies, you know, are impacted in different ways. Um, you know, some just completely shut down. Like I have a lot of music industry uh, clients. Well, they depend on live gatherings and you know people to congregate and musicians to you know perform concerts or or festivals, and that's just not happening right now. So um, it, it, I think that's why the guidance is also slow. Is it just impact? You have to. It impacts everybody differently. So. Thank you, Marina. Um, shall we have a look at uh, comparable benchmarks? Um, so if I understand correctly, um, like publicly available data for comparison is not available at real time, right? Which makes it a bit more difficult to um, make an accurate uh, compa comparison. So uh, Federico, if I may direct this question to you, can you explain what that means for transfer pricing? Yes, of course. Generally, under normal conditions, one of the most used methods around the world to test an intercompany transaction uh, is the TNMM method. Um, this method is usually applied using the multiple years approach. So, uh, in other words, uh, looking at the average of the comparables results of the three previous years. Considering that, uh, uh, as you told, public available data for comparables are not available in real time, because depend on the balance sheet of, of the company, um, when we will test the fiscal year 2020, we will have a time lag of two years. So having said that, uh, it is obvious that if we will test the fiscal year 2020 in a traditional way, so using the three years period, 2017-2019, uh, we will obtain a distorted analysis um, a significantly far away from the arm's length principle. This 
because nowadays we are living in a pandemic situation that have a very big impacts on the company's economics. In order to align the analysis with the actual economic conditions, we may adopt three kinds of approaches. For instance, including loss making in the comparable sets from it from an Italian perspective, uh, uh, generally, uh, tax authority exclude uh, comparables uh, uh, from the comparable sets, uh, the loss-making comparables. And uh, another, another approach could be choice from a different period of time, or another could be applying specific adjustment to the final sets. Uh, one of these could be towards the 25 percentile of the interquartile range. However, it should be always kept, kept in mind that the OECD guidelines are clear in maintaining that they need to perform numerous of substantial adjustment to key comparability factor may indicate that the third party transaction are in fact not suffi uh, sufficiently comparable. Which is going to lead us to, to the major challenge on how to justify the way that the comparability is going to be challenged during this time. And not only this time, but also the time to come, because 2020 is going to remain within the range of the three year period that you just mentioned, Federico. And it's going to uh, really affect the average of the comparability for the years to come as well. So it's not only 2020 uh, compliance uh, that is perhaps one of the first effective years, but. Yeah all of a sudden this is going to have a long-term impact because 2020 may or may not be discarded for certain industries we're talking about those industries that are losing nowadays but there are industries and marina just referred to that in the previous uh note uh, that are making a huge amount of money uh those that are uh, producing anything related to uh, either real or perceived uh, help for the uh, health issues, uh, health uh, products are becoming very profitable. The market is absolutely uh, disorganized and totally uh, coming up and down based upon the demand that is absolutely affected by the panic other than the reality. Therefore, those that are making huge amounts of profits are also going to face the same problem. And those are never going to see these profits ever, perhaps, unless right. there is another pandemic. So really, the unique and the uniqueness of the approach to how to really make the comparability of the benchmarks is going to be a harder documentation process that is just not going to limit to go back to the databases and make the benchmark as business as usual. Right, we need to, it's an excellent point, and we need to just probably be a little more creative in our approach, you know, is a three year, uh outlook enough for this industry you know at this time do we go to five years do we go to 10 years you know how do we capture this industry in normal times and and that's you know again unique uh to the different industries and then you know excellent point about you know just like the companies that are uh will be having you know more severe losses during this time there are companies that'll be having unusual profits that are not normal either, right? So um, it, it's it's really interesting because um, you know comparability to to the benchmark firms is is you know it's a bit of an imperfect science to begin with, right? It's about you know functions, assets, and risks, and and you know how that works. Do we need to try to get tighter? ranges you know do, do product comparability become more um important during this time um you know so many questions that come about and 
one of the big things that I see is, you know, with my bigger companies, they have this sort of hub and spoke, you know, uh, transfer pricing mechanism, you know, where the entrepreneurial risk taker is the one entity, the IP owner, you know, sort of lives and dies by the, uh, you know, the, the success of the company. And then there are service providers, you know, in, in various aspects in, in places of the world. And they're the lower risk, you know, net cost plus markup type of returns or, or targeted operating margins. Well, low function and low risk entities you know, it doesn't mean no risk entities, you know, and we need to kind of, you know, look at that again and say, why do they get a set positive return when the entire global organization is suffering? Um, so a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, a lot of new questions, a lot of things to consider. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next slide, may I just uh, remind the audience that if you have any questions, please use the chat box to direct them to our presenters and uh, we will address them towards the end of our uh, webinar. Okay, so the importance of transfer pricing compliance. Um, I guess you already uh, touched upon this on the previous slide. Um, but um, Marina, if I may go back to you, um, why is it extra important right now to demonstrate and document uh, commercial rationale for changes in transfer pricing and, and other planning decisions? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think uh, we spoke a little bit of this, but just to get into a little more detail, you know, certainly I, I do believe that audits will be up. Um, and I think, you know, um, transfer pricing will be more scrutinized than, than it has uh, even in the past. And, um, you know, it, it if you think about it, it's it's the taxpayer that needs to drive the discussion. I think that, you know, the IRS and the other tax authorities will be quiet on the subject. I think they'll sort of take that business as usual approach around it. And so it's up to the taxpayer to present their position and, you know, their uh, unique situation. Um, you know, if you think about it, you know, transfer pricing regulations, the goal and the is for the tax authorities to try to present that, you know, uh, differences in tax rate, the, the arbitrage in, in internal pricing, you know, to try to, um, you know, impact their, their overall tax rate. Um, and, you know, the, the, the internal pricing should be, of course, you know, market late rate arms, arms length. And this global pandemic, though it will impact the profitability of the firm and the transfer pricing mechanism, you know, it's not unique to any one country, uh, sorry, any one company, well, country as well, but any one company, um, and it's not driven by any one company so that they could solely profit from it. You know, it's just by definition, it is not the taxpayers doing, right? They have not tried to manipulate their taxes or their, you know, through transfer pricing. So I, I just think that, you know, it's not business as usual and it's up to the taxpayer and their advisor to tell that story, that operational story. Here's the impact of this global pandemic that we could not predict nor rally to try to, uh, you know, mitigate, right? Who can change their supply chain quickly? Who can, you know, their companies have not been able to, to minimize the impact, you know, as much as they would like to. So, um, and by the way, that goes the same for tariffs, right? The, the giant tariffs that were imposed. Those are political driven situations. You know, taxpayers should not be penalized for that. They should not be punished for that. But again, it is on the taxpayer to say that and to present that story because I believe the tax authorities will take that business as usual approach and not even not even in a, a deceitful way or, a, you know, but it, it, practicalities. We've been saying this whole time. It depends on the industry. It depends on the business. People are, you know, companies are impacted in different ways. So there's no one way to say, oh, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and then it'll be fine, you know? So taxpayers need to present that and, and capture that and, and move it forward. There is no that single recipe uh, to, to, to really uh, summarize that. Uh, and I guess that there are that several points to pick here. One of them is perhaps the new approach of tax planning. 
tax planning is, is a new challenge for all tax practitioners around the world uh, because the first step to think out of the box is that tax planning under the survival kit of COVID-19 is to really be able to document as much as possible, best way you can, this unique situation to get ready to go to court, because this at the end is going to be discussed in the courts. And that depending on the legal system may take too many years while the case is acknowledged by the courts. And once the, the positions take place in the courts of several uh, jurisdictions, therefore, is one of the first tiers of the, ta the new tax planning approach regarding this uh, uh, very critical point in life of uh, uh, enterprises is to have good documentation, a good business reason behind the decisions made to keep on the business under the COVID-19 situation. And also, the preparation of the compliance on the three-tier approach should be uh, always acknowledged as an approach from the bottom to the top and not from the top to the bottom. In other words, the OECD uh, recommendations regarding the three-tier approach, the local file, the master file, and the uh, country by country report shall not start from port at the end and then see how do I document my transactions even on a little subsidiary that might create a lot of uh, noise to the multinational group. Otherwise, the fair and the wise approach is going to have the single individual entities to be the ones that in fact do feed the master file and as a result of it, whether or not we uh, surpass the threshold, we are going to be able to submit our country by country report with a substantiated basis. Furthermore, the, the issue that uh, was raised by Marina regarding the, the, the tax arbitrage is going to be something that uh, countries are going to be competing very much uh, towards and uh, in order to uh, reactivate their economies. So is that a good business reason for a reallocation of assets, a reallocation of individuals, uh, the new policies of health for letting in and uh, uh, leaving out uh, personnel are going to uh, force us to reassess that analysis of the compliance and how are we going to document that is going to be one of the major challenges in the TP compliance. Well, talking about compliance, we all we only know that we have to be compliant and we have to remain compliant. And this leads me to a very simple question. Um, what are the characteristics of the arm's length principle? Until now, I would say it's comparability, experience, plausibility, or let's say justification. And all TP methods are based on these characteristics. And if we now take a look at the COVID-19 world, we find that there is no comparability anymore not at the moment at least, and we have no experience. We cannot um, make business decisions on experience because now everything is uh, driven in a new situation. So for the uh, uh, arm's length principles, two core characteristics are not available anymore. So what uh, remains is the application of plausibility, 
the justification of transaction and uh, the price of a transaction with the means of applying the common sense. On the one hand, this is a risk because nobody knows what is the common sense. On the other hand, it's a chance because you have a, a huge range to argument your doing, your pricing, your transactions. And um, in terms of compliance, it is what uh, Carlos has pointed out. Uh, you have uh, to take care that you document all steps that you do in order that you can show that you're plausible and you can justify what you do because the uh, other tools like comparability are not available at the moment. So maybe this is uh, a difficulty, but also a chance. That's from my side to this point. Thank you, After thank you, Christian. Um, if we if we move on to the next slide, I would like to discuss uh, financial transactions. So, uh, Federico, maybe if I can uh, direct this question to you. For obvious reasons, uh, multinational enterprises tend to centralize their cash availability during a crisis. And from a transfer pricing point of view, uh, what are the considerations in regard to financial transactions? Yep. Um, I guess that in this period, uh, also where in the past the subsidiary didn't need financial support uh, from the group, after COVID-19 probably they may need this support. And uh, this is of course the cases of the Italian subsidiaries. Um, we will see more cases uh, uh, of cash, cash centralization to optimize the treasury function of multinational enterprises in, in the near futures. And multinational enterprises also will finance short of cash of their related companies with extraordinary financial loans. And on this regard, it is important to analyze which kind of financial loans and uh, which are the main conditions of these financials, also in respect of the last guidelines on uh, fi uh, financial transaction used by the OECD. Um, from an, uh, a transfer pricing perspective, in all of these cases, it should be considered specific interest in line with the arm's length principle. And uh, uh, another issues regard uh, the existing funding arrangement in place between related parties. Uh, so also in this case, uh, all of these uh, arrangements uh, will be analyzing considering COVID-19 impacts uh, on the interest rates applied and uh, if is the case uh, amended and reprised or adjusted and uh, uh, probably one of the one one other issues that uh, we are going to uh, to manage is the credit ratings of uh, of the of the related parties uh, this because the covid-19 in many cases uh, create a, a very risky situation on the related parties and uh, uh, probably the credit ratings of these uh, uh, related companies is going to uh, to is going to uh, to go uh, worse than the uh, what are uh, so another Another point that uh, we are going to analyze uh, is the, uh, the presence of force majeure clauses in the financial transaction. And uh, it would be also necessary to establish whether or not a third parties under similar circumstances would have made use of it. Uh, just Federico, and one one of the other consequences uh, of the financing of the operations under the struggling days 
is the, the need of relaxation from tax authorities and governments regarding thin capitalization rules, because the, the, the need of uh, recurring to us the uh, uh, intra-group financing versus the arms uh, third party financing will immediately hit the rules of thin capitalization rules and the uh, allowance or limitations of the deductibility of the uh, interest. Uh, coming out of the related parties. Carlos, Federico, those are both really excellent points. Um, I, I want to add to them what I'm seeing with some of my uh, clients where, um, you know, cash is, is king right now, right? CEOs, CFOs, they're scrambling to, to access it, redistribute it, you know, where it's needed, you know, figure out where it is. And I think these times have brought to light the sort of strength of the multinationals, um, you know, centralized cash flow management uh, systems, right? And some, you know, of course are quite good and some maybe not as much. And I think that this is, you know, it's coming to light, right? You know, things are great when, when everything is going well, but, um, you know, find yourself in the middle of a crisis and, you know, you can always see the improvements uh, operationally uh, that are needed to your particular firm. So, uh, you know, most people don't really realize this, but transfer pricing is an excellent tool for developing cash flow management strategies, you know, as well as tax minimization. So it's, you know, it's a way to sort of, um, you know, change the substance and dynamics in the different entities um, and thus the funds flow, you know, to the higher risk and higher function and, you know, higher intangible ownership, you know, operations. So um, just wanted to throw that out there that I think that, um, you know, I think and I hope we're going to be seeing a lot more focus on, you know, centralized cash flow management, um, you know, strategies and tools. Thank you, Marina. Um, on that, I, th I think uh, you just created a really nice bridge to our next next slide. Um, the, re the reviewing of financial intercompany arrangements um, on the topic of cash flow, like obviously this is top of mind for many businesses in in times of uncertainty, like the one that we find ourselves in now. Um, how can a review of financial intercompany arrangements help with cash flow availability? And I think you kind of already answered some of that, Marina. Or maybe someone else would like to take that one. I I certainly I certainly can keep talking about it. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to give someone else a chance to jump in, but um, no, definitely definitely seeing the need, right? Um, you know. Uh, organizations have different levels of sophistication in those areas and you know i think like i said it's fine in normal times but these are not normal times so you know reconsider where your funds are people are getting uh, realizing that maybe they have too much cash in tax jurisdictions where the governments you know it's historically difficult to repatriate funds from that country for whatever reason perhaps there's a, a time lag or delay or takes 13 months and you know you don't have you know immediate access um and so i think that from a very high level you know ceos now are getting involved in where is our cash <laughs> and how do we get to it more efficiently in the future um and i think all you know entities will benefit from this experience in in some way, if they use it as a time to to sort of pause and reflect and look at their individual businesses and you know see where perhaps some of these weaknesses have come to light and 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 adjust accordingly for the future. Absolutely, and also the the cash pooling policies regarding how to uh, minimize the risk of those jurisdictions that uh, you just uh, mentioned, Marina, regarding the likelihood of a country getting a, a 
cash control uh, exit for uh, any given reason, those countries with uh, the sovereignty of uh, currency that is not easy to become uh, repatriated in uh, international currencies, that is going to be a major uh, challenge while we speak about this uh, COVID-19. That's perhaps one of the other risks that will be arising and the interest rates. The interest rates are now, if we go to comparables, are now just getting to uh, the, the lowest end for the investors. And of course, if that's going to be the measure of the new risk that uh, lenders are going to be taking, is going to be a major challenge for taxpayers to be able to substantiate their documentation in order to be able to uh, really show that this was an arm's length transaction while arm's length is going to have a reshape or a redefinition under the circumstances of COVID-19. How do you see it, Federico? Well, maybe I can add one point um, um, yes. concerning the necessity to reassess the sureties and guarantees in financial transactions. Uh, for Germany, it's a special point because we have a new jurisdiction of the federal tax court that says that only uh, the company loans that are appropriately short against risk are uh, tax-wise regarded. And uh, there we see now a clear actual necessity to work on that point. Um, and this does not only relate to uh, uh, cross-border uh, um, debts, but also uh, inbound uh, trans uh, financial transactions. So um, this point has a specific uh, 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 relationship to the uh, German uh, tax requirements uh, as we see them now. But maybe I can add one further point when we talk about intercompany arrangements in a broader sense and I want to address the topic that has been mentioned before uh, uh, slightly is the uh, relocation of functions. Uh, we have in Germany a specific legislation that is sort of exit tax that is triggered if you uh, relocate one function, fu function company function from, from one, one company to another company. And there we have to evaluate a so-called transfer package. And this is the, the value of the transfer package is the price for the uh, transfer function. There I see uh, a real tax uh, opportunity now for restructurings, whether they are corona related or not. And maybe they're were plans to restruct business before Corona, or there are now reasons to do it because of Corona. In both uh, uh, situations, uh, uh, the um, re-evaluation of functions will uh, presumably lead to lower values and presume presumably lead to um, a lower value of the transfer package. This means that you can um, now do such uh, uh, function relocations under uh, better conditions than before. So this is uh, um, another side of the medal if you want. Uh, of course, it's not good if the company value is low, but it can be good if you want to relocate the certain functions. That maybe as an addition to the point in the company arrangements. So 
so far. Yeah. That's a really good point. Oh, Federico, go ahead. Yeah, uh, regarding the financial intercompany arrangements, uh, um, as previously discussed, uh, we talk about the credit, the credit rating of the subs of um, multinational groups. And um, from Italian perspective, we are used to, uh, to manage the, the interest rates uh, with uh, uh, with uh, many approach, one of these uh, is uh, the notching up and the notching down of the credit rating. Um, and in this case, one of the the key issues is to investigate correctly uh, which is the strategic level of the subsidiary. And uh, uh, of course, with the COVID-19 impacts, uh, we we will see a reorganization of multinational group and probably the strategic level of subsidiary is going to change. And uh, one of the reasons why the existing funding arrangement has to be uh, revised and amended uh, is due to the modification of credit rating of uh, these subs. And, uh, and we, we of course, uh, amend many, many agreements inside the, the multinational groups. A good point about intercompany agreements too is it's the, definitely the one area of transfer pricing where I insist, you know, that clients have them. It's 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 very critical for uh, for financing and and financial transactions to have all the terms laid out. And and you know set out into a, a legal agreement. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, we are near the end of our uh, webinar. Um, to anyone, if if you still want to um, post a question in the chat box, um, please feel free to to direct anything to our presenters. We are um, at the towards the end of the of the webinar, so we will address your questions via email. Um, I guess that leads me to um, say thank you to our presenters today. Um, are there any final thoughts you want to share? Yes, I guess one of the uh, final uh, uh, thought of here is that the uh, purpose of this uh, webinar is just to create the fed up of uh, the subject. I mean, we, we couldn't pretend to uh, cover all matters arising as a result of uh, this uh, new challenging uh, era. And I guess that the purpose uh, we have accomplished with is to uh, let all of our participants be able to realize that this is a subject we have to pay more attention than just the approach of business as usual. Yeah, we have learned that there are still more questions than answers, but if we are able to put the right questions, we will find the right answer. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for anyone who is interested to uh, learn more about transfer pricing during the uh, COVID-19 crisis or any other uh, tax-related resources, uh, please visit our COVID-19 resource hub via um, hlb.global slash COVID-19. And um, that concludes the webinar for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.